The following podcast contains alcohol-enhanced conversations about alcohol, as well as a potential for discussions about other topics of dubious, disturbing, possibly offensive, but usually hilarious interest. The opinions stated herein are solely of the person stating them, and any endorsement of these opinions by any other party is not implied. Foul language is likely, but intolerant viewpoints are not. Listener intoxication is advised. Hello and welcome to the first Whiskumentary from the Whiskey Tangent Podcast. I'm Scott. And I'm Ed. And if you've never heard the term Whiskumentary before, it's because we just made it up. Brilliant. <laughs> and in honor of the 100-year anniversary of the enactment of Prohibition, Ooh. that's the topic we chose. This will be an absolutely riveting oh, yeah. four-part series about a very dry topic. See what he did there? <laughs> this is part one, which will focus on the years 1900 to 1920, and the other three parts will be released over the next three weeks. And Ed's here to start us off doing his usual thing. Gather around, everybody. I'm going to tell you a horror story. <laughs> a horror story that actually happened. A time period that America went buck-ass crazy. <laughs> they really did. And banned alcohol for public consumption. Now, the first part we're going to be focused on today when we get into it is the insanity that led up to Prohibition. We are going to try to focus on the whiskey side of it because we are a whiskey tangent podcast. So, right. I mean, Prohibition itself is a gigantic issue. Yeah. Anyone who sat down for the very thorough and detailed Ken Burns documentary on it, if you're interested in it, it's a three-part series you can see on Netflix. It's very informative. Yeah. Um, because there is reasons for it. And the reasons are actually very fascinating because if you think about it, America, it would take a perfect storm. For our country, who loves to drink, who loves personal freedoms, to get together in 1919 and vote to outlaw alcohol. All the way across the board. Craziness. Yeah. So we're going to talk about why that happened in this episode. And a lot of it's going to make you go, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, because some of them are good reasons, actually. Well, at the time. And you have to remember the time period. Sure, sure. So the temperance movement is what leads up to prohibition. The temperance meaning getting rid of alcohol, right? right? That's what it means. If you hear temperance movement, it's a group that's trying to get rid of alcohol. The suffragette movement was about getting women the right to vote. And a lot of them were the same people. Like Susan B. Anthony, she was a big suffragette about women's right to vote. She also was a big part of the temperance movement. And if you go farther back in time, a lot of the people who were uh, on the temperance movement were also abolitionists against slavery, if you go that far back. Right. So they had some good ideas and good concepts. And you have to understand, America in 1840 is different than America today in a lot of ways. First of all, the Ken Burns documentary said that the average adult American was drinking 88 bottles of liquor per year. <laughs> I mean, that's wow. three times what the average American drinks today. That's half what I drink. Not Scott and I. <laughs> I want to be clear. We are right at that 88 number. Okay. <laughs> yeah. well, but the maybe, average. Maybe American, together. Yeah. Right. So yeah. we want to talk real quick about a couple of the components of the temperance movement that started the craziness. One was the um, women's Christian temperance movement. Their first great leader was Frances Willard from like 1879 until she died in 1898. It had eventually 44 departments and dealt with everything from homeless children to jobs programs to as well as getting the women the right to vote, as well as getting alcohol banned first at the state level, but then with the eye on global. Yeah, that complete. was surprising to me. They, they had, wanted to, to ban alcohol everywhere on earth. 
They had a giant canvas petition with like over like 1.5 million signatures yeah, on it. For, for a bunch of women who have no testicles, that's pretty ballsy. Mm. See what I'm saying? What I'm doing? I see, what did see what I did there? At its high point, the Women's Christian Temperance Movement had 350,000 members when Prohibition was finally passed. They used to go town by town and like pray in front of saloons and just be annoying to them and be like, you're sinning and go home and be with your family to anyone that tried to go in. And, and, yeah, and didn't the bar owners and patrons do terrible things well, them? It depended. In the rural areas, no. Um, I think they were in Kansas, right? So when they got to like Wichita, mm-hmm. which is like their bigger city, the bar owners and the patrons were drunk and unruly and they like threw stones at them and would let them come in and then hit them with buckets of beer and throw them out into the snow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, wow. they did terrible things considering that it was just women praying. Now, yeah. someone who took a more aggressive posture was a woman named Carrie Nation. Scott, yeah. you're, you're a big fan of Carrie Nation. <laughs> Carrie Nation. I like her uh, moxie. She would take a hatchet and walk into bars and just smash up the bar. Smash the bottle, smash the mirrors she'd bring behind rocks, the bar. Yeah, she'd bring rocks too in her pockets and just yeah. whip them around and yeah. break everything she could. Yeah, and then she would just go bar to bar down the street. And she didn't care if she got arrested. Sometimes she did. Sometimes she didn't. One day she got arrested four times and released. And every time she got released, she went and broke up more bars. Till finally people locked up their bars and like, you can't come in here. Right. This one little tiny old lady with an axe. They had, nobody could stop her. Nobody could figure out what to do with her. <laughs> right. Like she just ran amok. Yeah. Imagine your grandmother going into a bar and just smashing it up. What would you do? Yeah. The, like, the owners are right there. Like they're not doing anything. Like literally destroying the mirrors and all the bottles and all the glassware and just just being a total dick about it. You right, know what I mean? Like, right. I, like I mean, if it was my bar, I, I don't know. I, I I don't. I'd like to think I wouldn't backhand carry nation, but <laughs> and at some point you figured somebody would have. But that, no. Yeah, no. that's what I mean. I was uh, like, I don't know how she didn't get arrested more times. Exactly. Every time she did it, like she's committing vandalism. Although in Kansas, where she was doing it at the time, these right. bars were illegal so technically that's why originally she wasn't but then she went to other states and other towns and did this right before we should probably back up in the point that before right. prohibition was passed some states passed laws to restrict the process of buying alcohol in public and kansas was one of those states that did that there's only four of them in the beginning yeah but um, it's always to help the poor working class fools that spend their hard-earned money on beer and stuff. But the reality is no one asked them if they wanted help. Right. You know, they were like, I worked all day in the coal mines. I'd like a beer to get this coal dust out of my throat. Oh, no, no, no. It's bad for you. Well, one of the reasons also why the temperance movement started was because women were getting the short end of the stick when their men would come home all drunk and belligerent and take it out on them and the children. Um, not every man, of course, but it was enough of a problem that women started to rebel. They, it was the whole start of the women's empowerment movement and not wanting to take it anymore. Correct. And 88 bottles was the average. There was actually a group called the Washingtonians, which was like kind of like the beginnings of AA. It was all heavy drinkers that got together and pledged not to drink over half a million million people signed up an agreement in that group not to drink so if you take them off the mix that means the drinkers are actually drinking 110 115 bottles of, of whiskey a year that's a bottle every three days i mean yeah you're not living a good life you're not employable i understand it was a problem yeah that i would think is more than we and the groups that we're talking about and we're going to bring up the anti saloon league which is actually the biggest player in this game they blamed it on corruption prostitution spousal abuse and other criminal activities and so all that was laid at the brewers and distillers as being, you know, the creators of this problem and the target of the reform movement. Mm. Though there is a big difference between the distillers and the brewers, and we'll get to that. That's true. Because the uh, brewers were mostly German immigrants. Like, if you think about all of the brewer names that are around today, even though they've been bought up by larger corporations, Anheuser-Busch, Miller, Strohs, Schlitz. Pabst. Yep. All of those came from Germany. And what we saw in that time period... From 1865 to 1918, which is right before when Prohibition passed, a total of 27.5 million people, mostly from Europe, had immigrated into America, 4 million from Germany alone. This led to tensions that emerged between immigrants practicing their traditions and native-born Americans who saw these traditions as a threat to the understandings of being an American. So it's amazing that 100 years later, we still have arguments about who is a real American and, right. and what impact immigration and immigrants are having on our lives. You know, being a history guy, you see it. Every generation has their own story about how, oh, I know we're Im- we were immigrants, our grandparents were, but they, they were different. You know, they helped the country. And now what we have is these other immigrants that come in and they're just eroding American culture. And this is the same argument that they had back in the late 1800s and especially leading up to World War One. 
Right. So Ed alluded to the fact that there was a perfect storm. So the uh, temperance movement, the women's movement, the immigration, and you'll learn in a bit how that German brewer influence contributed to the perfect storm, but also uh, business interests because they had a very powerful lobby in Congress. Right. The United States Brewer Association. The so you're seeing these immigrants getting powerful politically and the real American politicians found that as a threat. Right. And the fact that um, the anti saloon League, which is a group that became a political force. And up to this point, there was a social movement. But what the anti saloon League did if there was a candidate that was a wet candidate, then they would just focus on getting him out of office. Now, the anti saloon League was founded by Reverend Howard Hyde Russell, but it was actually under the leadership of Wayne Weber that things really got done. And if you were a politician and you were against Wayne Weber, you weren't a politician very long. Right. They saw what the wets were doing with their business interests and their lobbying of Congress and how powerful they got. And they adopted their methods and they became just as powerful, if not more powerful. And they were able to get all these wets so-called out of office. Right. And when he died, people said Wayne Weber would be remembered forever as one of the most powerful Americans ever. Yeah. We don't talk about him now. Especially how times change. But right. at the time of his death, he was considered one of the most powerful political individuals that America had ever seen. He's a man that had incredible personal power for someone that you've never heard of. Something that I just said there will be used to make a cognizant sense. <laughs> no, it all sounded pretty good. Okay. So I think we should mention two of the things that we found surprising in doing our research of this. And those were the 16th Amendment about income tax. Right. And the upcoming census of 1920. Right. So in 1913, they passed the 16th Amendment, which allowed for the government to tax a person's income. And the anti saloon League and the Women's Christian Temperance Union supported it. Yeah. Now, why is this important? Because they knew they would never be able to outlaw alcohol unless they could replace the tax money that the government earned from alcohol. So the income tax was going to generate over $100 million a year. I'm sorry, $100 billion a year mm -hmm. in income tax was going to be enough to cover the money lost from taxing alcohol. So once the temperance movement got that through, they were on their way. And they wanted to get the amendment passed before the census was taken in 1920. Why, Scott? Because there was a boom in the cities. Remember, this is the Industrial Revolution and the outcome of that. And cities' population growth was a far outpacing the rest of the country. And the cities were primarily wet. They like to drink in the cities. Right. So if they still like to drink in the cities, I like to drink in the city when I'm in the city. I like to drink everywhere. <laughs> but in the city, it just seems more fun. It does. Um, especially Philly. Philly's got a lot of great Philly's bars. Philly's got a lot of great bars. Yeah. Um, so the people who were for prohibition were afraid that when the census was tabulated, that would push the representation of Congress toward the states that had the larger cities in them and leave the smaller states with less representation. Right. Because the difference between 1910 and 1920, the population of cities was huge, all because of the Industrial Revolution and better techniques in agriculture. So there's less people living rurally, more people going to the city for jobs and the industrialization involving the products for World War One, people working in factories. And then the last piece of the perfect storm. Guess who we're fighting in World War One? Ed? The Germans. That is correct. And who owns all those uh, breweries? Ed? The Germans do. That is correct. And who are opposed to prohibition? Ed? Uh, the Germans. That is correct. Yeah, so what do you think happened? Ed? So what happened was we're fighting the Germans overseas and we're fighting the Germans on temperance at home. That is correct. The Germans are trying to poison your families with their beer while they kill your sons overseas. Mm. And so you put those two facts together and you have anti-German sentiment. They lose their political power. And this is when they were renaming sauerkraut into Liberty Cabbage and things <laughs> like that. Uh, oh, you were yeah. laughing, but remember when France wouldn't let us fly over their country to bomb somebody? Yeah, we renamed uh, French fries Freedom Fries. Right, freedom Fries. So it's like it, it, the history repeats itself. It's hysterical. It really does. So basically, as the anti-German sentiment grew in 1917 and 1918, the Brewers Association lost their power and Americans even stopped drinking beer. And when you think about it, in 1865, we made about three and a half million barrels of beer. I mean, that's a lot already, but, but it's about to explode, right? In 1900, they're making 39 and a half million. And up until 1915, it's almost 60 million barrels of beer a year. Holy damn. Right before when World War I has kicked right, off. Right. So it's 20 times. Yeah. 
Right. Shit. And that was all the German immigrants. And these were first generation, a lot of them. Like Augustus Bush, I mean, he had a medal from the Kaiser that right. he used to like to wear around, you right. know? Right. So Pabst and, and Friedrich Miller and Schlitz, they all were pretty much first generation. So it's not like they were removed. It's not like their dad was in Germany. They were Germans. And so it was easy to turn everyone against them. I think we should also say, like, it kind of goes hand in hand with this. The abolitionist movement was also happening big time. Right. The racism of the Deep South was a big factor. There's nothing scarier to a racist white man in the South than a black man with a ballot in one hand and a bottle in the other. Mm. Because the one made them powerful and the other one, in their opinion, made them unstable. So so the reality is it was easy to also use that as a tool. Right. It was another wedge that they could use. Right. And so there's racism against immigrants. There's racism against minorities. There is uh, the empowerment of women. There is men acting badly by drinking, not working, spending the family's paycheck on booze. Because it's not just booze, right? It's prostitution. It's gambling. It's a lot of stuff that goes into the other vices, right? Right. I mean, when you hear the litany of all these reasons, you can see now why it actually happened. Like, it didn't come out of nowhere. Well, like in the beginning where you said, it was like, how could we have done this? It really did take the perfect storm of all these things. And lastly, the temperance movement wasn't above cheating a little bit. The Women's Christian Temperance Union had a little bit of a problem, you know, that Jesus turning the water into wine. Oops. Awkward. Awkward. Jesus liked wine. Why can't I? So they had an interesting strategy for this, including a bit of editing. Scott, you'll appreciate that. Scott, you'll be an editor. Sure. Temperance activists hired a scholar to rewrite the Bible. He did what now? He edited the Bible. Wow. Removing all references to alcohol beverages. What did they change the water into? I don't know. Yeah. Iced tea, a sweet tea, maybe. A sweet tea. Jesus. Yeah, for the South. Yeah, right, yeah. right. And Jesus turned the water to sweet tea. Everybody have a good night. <laughs> so as we <clears throat> come down to it, the Prohibition Amendment, the 18th Amendment, which was introduced um, in the Senate by a, a senator from Texas, which is amazing to me at Texas, because I've just pictured them drinking whiskey all day down there. Uh. And then it was also introduced in the House by Alabama, and they passed it. 36 states voted for it, with, I believe, Nebraska being the 36th state. Yeah. And our own state of New Jersey fought it tooth and nail. All right. So did New York. They fought it tooth and nail. They didn't like it. They didn't want it. And I think they were one of the last two to finally ratify it. Why would you ratify it? Well, because when New Jersey balked at it, the federal government held up millions of dollars in grants mm-hmm. and stuff like that until New Jersey voted it through. Yeah. No, that's right. Uh, that's how they get you. They get you with the money. Correct. So that's how it happened. Um, so we said we were going to focus a little bit on the whiskey, right? Because this is the whiskey tangent podcast, and that was a very long tangent about prohibition, right? <laughs> well, well, at least how prohibition happened. So uh, on AmericaWhiskeyTrail dot com, there is a list of the significant people and events that happened between the years of eighteen sixty and nineteen hundred, leading right up to the history lesson that we just gave you. In 1864, David M. Beam, the owner of the Old Tub Distillery, was blessed with one child. You know who that was, Ed? Jim. That is correct. The one and only Jim Beam. In 1865, Benjamin Harris Blanton started a distillery in Leestown, Kentucky. Jack Daniel opened his Tennessee distillery in 1866. George A. Dickel, the other great proponent of Tennessee whiskey, started a very respectable rectifying and bottling operation in 1866. George Garvin Brown, who created Old Forester, and his half-brother J.T.S. Brown went into the wholesale whiskey business in 1870. Frederick and Philip Stitzel built their first distillery in Louisville in 1872. Their company would later merge with the Weller Company and become known as Stitzel Weller. We've mm. talked about them before. Yeah. Johnny Fitzgerald, whose old Fitzgerald bourbon would become the joy of the Stitzel Weller brand, <laughs> <laughs> built a distillery in 1870. James E. Pepper built the James E. Pepper distillery in 1879. You've seen his uh, 1776 bourbons on the shelves. Right. His name has resurfaced. In 1882, a distillery by the name of R.B. Hayden and Company. So don't be hating. Fired up its stills to make the first bottles of Old Granddad. Wow. Yeah. What year is that? 1882. Wow. Um, Jim Beam joined with Albert J. Hart to run the Old Tub Distillery in 1892. Paul Jones introduced his Four Roses whiskey to Kentucky in 1888. And in 1893, one of the most colorful characters ever to grace the whiskey industry, Julius Pappy Van Winkle entered the whiskey business as a salesman for W.L. Weller and Son. So all this was happening right before 1900. 
So, right. So there's this huge 30 year period where whiskey and bourbon is just exploding. All the talents in there, they're developing the techniques that we all cherish, you know, as far as charred barrels and the aging process and storing it at different levels in a rick house. All these things are being tried and practiced. And then just when things get good, right. who comes along, the temperance movement and fucks it all up. <laughs> One of the brands that still flourished during Prohibition and was there around before it was Old Overholt Rye. And now back then, it was a bottled and bond 100 proof expression. It's 80 proof now. The formula is a little different. But the reality was when the Volstead Act was passed, Old Overholt had been given to the ownership of Andrew Mellon, who was the Secretary of the Treasury under President Harding. And most of it was distilled in the fall of 1921 and then bottled all through Prohibition particularly in 1933. So this is not quite the old overhaul as we know it today, but there has been an old overhaul rye whiskey in production consistently since 1810. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I mean, it started in West Overton, south of um, Pittsburgh. That's a whiskey rebellion country. Right. You can still buy this. It's considered bottom shelf, probably mm, $18, $19 a bottle, <laughs> right? Something yeah. like that. It does say since 1810 on the bottle. Well, right. And, and that's what my research concluded. I didn't actually even, I haven't even read the bottle. Yeah. So let's take a little sip it real quick. Um, yeah, it's not good, honestly. <laughs> it's drinkable. I get a lot of cinnamon on it. Yeah, it's, it's a drinkable whiskey. I mean, I'm not dumping it out or spitting or it's simply being that Scott and I have had two very interesting ryes today already. <laughs> the Jack Daniels single barrel rye yeah. and a Pikesville 110 proof rye, which was delicious, uh, just to get our mouth into the rye mood to jump into the old overhold here. Does it say the mash bill of this? It doesn't, but I'm on a Prohibition whiskey website, not oh, on oh, the oh. old overhold. Do you want to see if a uh, whiskey jug has done it? <laughs> Let's see if our palate, the whiskey jug, has given a review of old overhold. He certainly has had time to do it as it's been around since 1810. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's see what he says. Because he usually has the mash bill on everything, so that's really why I wanted to. Yeah, he's very thorough. Don't this get... says uh, at least 51% rye, of course, because it's a rye. So, no, apparently he couldn't find out either. 40% alcohol by volume, so 80 proof, right. uh, age three years, price about 20 bucks. On the eye, he has golden honey. It's so absolutely. Absolutely it's, great. It's got a great color to it. It's, it's like very light, yeah. On the nose, the first thing I noticed is a thick, sweet scent, like caramel frosting. Yeah. I, I, I agree. It's very sweet. Followed up by some graham cracker pie crust, cinnamon, and green apples. You smelled cinnamon, so yeah. you're right there. Round that out with a bit of iodine. <laughs> Come on. And sadness. <laughs> and the slight but steady rye spice, you end up with a nice bouquet that is pleasing, but quite light on the rye notes. Yeah, And no violet, by the way. Not a, t not a touch of violet in it. Ed, all. you don't need to be violet today. <laughs> the palate, uh, the rye spice pops a bit more here, and it's accompanied by hints of lemon pepper. Coarse grains and some soft woodiness. <laughs> oh, there's woodiness to it already. Right? Yeah, uh, woody, very woody. Very woody. A strange, subversive sweetness runs alongside the spicy, peppery fruit and creates a very interesting juxtaposition of flavors. I will say that since it's been on ice and it's kind of infused a little bit of water into it, it's actually not terrible. This is much better on ice because we drank yes. it neat first. and It we was didn't... not good neat at all. It was very repugnant. Yeah. Uh, it was just very abrasive. The flavors didn't blend well. The finish says medium with green apples and graham cracker that fades to sugared oak. This sounds crazy, but I'm just saying, if you have $17 and you just want to sip on something, let it get about a third of the way on the ice, mm -hmm. and it's pretty drinkable. Yeah, definitely some water. Definitely. Put some water in it. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, if you don't want to wait, just put it a couple cubes and then put a shot of water on top of two shots of uh, this, and I think you'll be good. Yeah, you keep it in 83 I mean, uh, that's a little high for me. Yeah, I would I, I would be at a 77, but yeah. I, I wouldn't be a 50. It's better than I expected. Yeah, it's not bad. And so uh, part one is over, and we leave you with prohibition just being enacted and ratified by the states. And when we come back for part two, we'll be talking about all the hell that breaks loose during <laughs> prohibition. Yeah. All right. So we thank you for tuning in to our first Whiskumentary. Well, I hope you liked it. And if you do like it, <laughs> good for you, because you got three parts left coming. <laughs> and if you found it a little bit dry and informative, heavy well we'll see you in february <laughs> time to be proud her boys in line over there over there send the word send the word over there that the yanks are coming the yanks are coming the drums rum coming everywhere so prepare say a prayer send the word
words and the words to beware. We'll be over, we're coming over, and we won't come back till it's over, over there.